Welcome to the Chief of Cybersecurity Podcast, where we discuss relevant information concerning the cybersecurity workforce, business development, and best practices made possible by CMIS. Learn more at CMIS.net. And for a list of authorized publications, visit DwayneHart.com. And now, here's your host, Dwayne Hart. Welcome again, my listeners. We are definitely moving ahead this season with um, with the Chief of Cybersecurity Podcast Sessions. I always say we because if it wasn't for all the great people that have purchased the Cybersecurity Mindset and, and listened to my podcast, um, I would not be moving forward as gracefully and fast and able to deliver much needed information. You know, in the past podcast, which was which was episode four, developing a successful cybersecurity maturity program, I actually ended it by actually making a great statement. And you know, that gave you know that that statement was that uh, you are you are only as safe as your cybersecurity mindset. So let's think about that for a second, right? If your cybersecurity mindset is working at a high level, so that means that that you're safe and you are driving protection for an enterprise. Or if you are a common user, then you are practicing safety maybe on Facebook. Now, outside of common users, there are people that work in the cybersecurity field. And one of the things that normally happens is that individuals go to college and they get educated. And I give claps off to anybody that have went through school and got educated and probably worked on their bachelor's, their master's, and their doctorate. It shows great motivation. It shows that you took the time to study. On the weekends, you got up every morning and um, you wrote papers. There were some times when you probably wanted to go on a vacation, but no, you had to sit at home and to do homework. And maybe you did go on a vacation, but you took your classwork with you. Even so, at the time you were out there fishing, right? Um, you actually had your laptop and you had your book open, right? But you kept your eyes on that fresh catch because you were committed to the process. But like many people after leaving school, a lot of cybersecurity um, people are stranded. Stranded to wonder, okay, I have a degree and I learned all this information and I really wanna go on a job and I really wanna be effective. I wanna make a difference. So where should I start? And likewise, certain people find the niche and then they move through the cybersecurity industry and they become well-seasoned professionals. Then there are others that are probably still struggle for so many years because of the way that certain labor categories are probably organized and also too, based on the ideals of what is a security engagement. So for this podcast session, building security engagements into the cyber workforce, we're gonna talk about how do you transition from that college level student or that person that passed their CISSP and marry that into cybersecurity and to be effective. And to go and make that happen, there are certain things that need to exist. One is we need to talk about the security labor force. We need to talk about some unwritten rules. We need to talk about continuing, continual engagements, leadership and development, and some of the risks that are associated with not knowing how to approach security engagement. And one of my favorites is implementing a cultural shift because these are very important topics that, that will bridge everything together so that an individual can understand how to engage cybersecurity. 
So let's talk about the security workforce. Okay, now there are so many labor categories out there from engineers to analysts to architects to uh, specialists, and some of the some of these labor categories can cross over. But at the end of the day, you are a cybersecurity professional. And in order to make it into the cybersecurity industry, everyone has to have education, all right? Everyone has to have training. Training, training is about going through and learning how to do your job. Some of us have learned by OJT, which is on-the-job training, and some have been put in the formal workshops where you can learn how to do your job. And some people are lucky enough to have individuals that would guide them through their cybersecurity career. And this is where leadership falls in. So, so we're going to talk about that later. Complex job titles. Yes, there's so many complex job titles out there on the market, um, you, you know, from engineer to analysts to, like, operators. And sometimes it can be confusing. There are pitches about you can get your degree in one year. I am not going to respond to that. All I have to say is that if you can get your degree in one year and if you think you can gain the right of information to enter, to enter the industry, go for it. There are some talk about all you need is a certification. It takes more than a certification to become a cybersecurity steward because, because that's a three-legged uh, process that goes on. It's called education, it's called certification, and it's called experience. Those are your three legs. College students may not like the career field. Yes, there are some college students that have been through a complete pipeline of training and realized that cybersecurity is not something that, that they want to do for the rest of their life because cybersecurity requires people to learn. Cybersecurity requires people to be constantly engaged because it's a changing environment. My job makes me a secretary. There are times when individuals graduate from college and, and they are positioned to become secretaries. So when someone becomes a secretary, you know, the only thing that happens is that they are pigeonholed to push paperwork. This is a career killer. This, this really kills the engagement practices. Individuals do not have a chance to engage cybersecurity now. They become the individual that is just responsible for administrative work. And this is a failure of leadership. Too many meetings. I realize that we have an environment where people work remotely, and there are some environments that, that, that I've heard of where people have five, maybe six meetings a day. And, you know, these meetings are anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. So let's just, let's just sum the numbers up here for a minute. Let's just say five. If, if a person is having five meetings a day for an hour, so that's five hours a meeting, and if they're lucky enough to go to lunch and come back, you really only have two hours of work to get done. Even if they are in half hour apart from each other, okay, and so a person has 2.5 hours of meetings a day, all right? Then they go take a lunch. So that's three and a half hours. You only got four hours of work to do, a little bit over four hours of work to do, all right? So, you know, the labor force has changed a lot because of high tempo environments, because individuals are requested to do more in cybersecurity now. But in the middle of that, there has to be a continuous engagement because if there is not a continuous engagement, this harms the workforce because the individual has to know how to do their job because you can get all the training, you can get all the education, but in order to get the experience, an individual has to have hands-on practice, right? And... Part of those security engagements goes beyond the technical scope itself. 
they can exist into understanding unwritten rules. So let's talk about some unwritten rules of the cybersecurity industry. Politics plays a key role. If you're not rubbing shoulders with the right people, sometimes you may not find yourself on a job very long. That is a true fact. These are unwritten rules of the IT industry. And these are some engagement practices that normally happens on job. Bureaucracy. You have different kind of departments. You you have people that are on different teams. Uh, maybe you have a networking team and you have a cloud team. And there's a lot of bureaucracy that goes on because they're a group. And you may not be able to obtain certain things from these certain groups because you're not part of their group. Some of the other thing is uh, monet- monetary outweighs what you were taught. See, in this cybersecurity industry, it's about saving money. Nobody wants to spend a lot of money, really, but they want cybersecurity to operate. A lot of organization has to take, take a balance and look at both and see which side they want to sway on. Sometimes organization will accept risk, right, because of that monetary budget, especially if the risk does not cause too much harm. And then there are times when organizations have a large budget pool where they can spend a lot of money on cybersecurity. So monetary outweighs what you were taught because you were not taught that in school. While you were in school, you were told to be a cybersecurity steward, to walk on a job, and to help reduce risk, but you were not told that bureaucracy plays a key role, and if organizations do not have money, then that kind of affects the way you approach cybersecurity, and this is your security engagement. Shift blame happens when unlikable people are on board. If you're an unlikable person in an organization and something goes wrong, you're going to get the strike, all right? This is part of the unwritten rules. So in an organization, a lot of times that happens because there's a breakdown in communications. Um, you know, it can be from other reasons that, that, that certain people want to make sure that the light always shines on them, especially if they, they've been working on the organization uh, platform for a bit and, you know, they're the golden child. Nobody wants... Nobody wants their light to be taken away. So a lot of times you come onto a job, these are unwritten rules that are not told to you, okay? One of the things I always like to think, uh, say is that be quiet, observe everything, okay? This is one of the unwritten rules as well too. Look and see who talks at meetings, who gets the special projects, who gets promoted, who gets demoted, and how does the boss imply and for expectations, all right? Because that's a part of your security engagements. And as before, this is an unwritten rule. This is not anything that's written down on a sheet of paper. Uh, you're not going to find this in an SOP. Uh, you're not going to find this through email. This is a learned experience on a job. But in order to become a very smart individual and to understand how these unwritten rules operate, you you as a person needs to have a continual engagement. And when you have that continual engagement, you always focus. You are focused on the job and making sure things are getting done. You are a problem solver. When When it comes to project tasks, you as a person know what's supposed to happen. You can go execute those project tasks because if you're not part of these project tasks and and pretty much you're given project tasks on a frequent basis, then you may not perform well. And if you don't perform well, you may become the unlikable person. Communication is very important. I've always liked to state that you communicate early and you communicate often because when that happens, you will always have that continuous engagement into cybersecurity because the way you engage cybersecurity, and I would say this again, makes a difference on how well you can be successful with your career and also to carry out certain uh, projects. You 
also has to be thinking cybersecurity. So your speech and your language has to be on a cybersecurity level. Some of the other areas that actually needs to be addressed is that you have to have a defensive mindset. Okay. No one can really teach individuals how to have a defensive mindset. This is just something like a little bug that just grabs you as you work in this IT industry. It's just certain things that just grab you. Because if you think about a, about the defensive mindset, it's stating that you see something wrong and you take action. You don't wait until someone tells you to go take action. These are part of these soft skill sets and a couple of things that should exist when you when you work in the IT industry or like the cybersecurity industry as well. Ownership is another uh, key term that that is rarely spoken about because someone has to take ownership for cybersecurity. And if no one takes ownership, then you just satisfy the hacker's appetite because that's a hacker's appetite there. If no one has ownership, then I guess the hackers have to take over. Negative thinking is one of the areas that someone should probably try to move away from because if you have negative thinking, your overall engagement means that you don't approach your job with a positive attitude. If you don't have a positive attitude, then it can spread like cancer to all your groups and all your different teams. And you'll find out that people don't want to work along with you. And now you become the unlikable person. So in order to ensure that cybersecurity guru A that has just graduated out of college becomes successful, there needs to be a certain practice in place. And one of those practices is called leadership and development. I myself spent my last three years in the military designing and teaching leadership and development. And one of the things that I learned about leadership and development is that it's a tool. And when the subordinates fail, it is not the subordinates' fault. It is the leader's fault because leaders are supposed to guide and develop. And that can be a, a challenge in this IT industry and also cybersecurity because a lot of leaders are taxed with working in high-tempo environments. So to sit down and to have that five-minute talk with a subordinate once a week on a daily basis may not happen. But, but with a little work, it can be done. Here goes, here goes some of the areas of leadership and development here that, uh, that I want to talk about. Favoritism. Favoritism exists in the industry, okay? People show favoritism because they're comfortable dealing with certain people, and then there are certain people that, that they just don't like, okay? If uh, someone has been working on the, on the um, leader for five years and someone else come on board, well, if that leader is um, close to that person, and that's been their right hand man for or or like female for like the past five years. Maybe there's some favoritism that is going to come on board. Maybe those two people graduated from the same college. Maybe those two people um, are family members. I don't know, but favoritism do exist. If you're in leadership, uh, I say that you do not use favoritism because you have a staff of many people that had to engage cybersecurity. If you engage cybersecurity with favoritism, um, that means your entire staff may not want to work for you and and you may not get that motivation that you need out of your staff. Learn the environment. See, that's very important when it, when it comes to leadership because if you don't know the environment, then you're setting yourself up for failure. When you know the environment, see, that consists of the technologies. See, that consists of the uh, team players that you have, what's their overall function in the organization itself, um, some of the management practices that has to be in place, some of the unwritten rules that are in place, some of the 
bureaucracies that are in place, those are things that that leaders need to know. And those are not things that are written down on a sheet of paper. Those are part of a continual engagement. When you engage the workforce and if you engage cybersecurity constantly on a daily basis, then then you will learn the environment. One of the other areas, too, is that you need to remove traditional thinking because your last company operated a certain standard toward cybersecurity that may not work in this current environment that you're in. I have seen many and many of great leaders that are do great jobs, but for some reason they have to get deprogrammed because they're so used to working and operating cybersecurity at a certain level based on their experience because they don't want to change. I, I would say for sure is that that happens because people are, are uh, comfortable because people do not like change. Some of the other areas too here, um, well, you have to be a listener and listen to what people have to say because when people make statements in these meetings, it carries a lot of weight. So you have to have an environment open where everyone is freely and open, openly can actually talk and actually can discuss because the purpose of having a team is to have everybody to collaboratively use their knowledge and pool and pool all of that together so that everyone can learn. But if you only have one person in the room talking all the time, nobody else really wants to talk. So if a leader allows that to happen, then he might was to just have a meeting with that one person only. Some of the other areas here, um, no leader started as a CISO pulling cables. Okay. When I first got out to Navy, my first job was pulling cables. I was working in IT, but I was pulling cables. And still today, I remember that job. And there are certain people now that are trying to transition into IT that are doing the same job. There are some people that have came out of college and they have so much education, but when they get on a job, they say, okay, you're going to work with the networking team. But, you know, there's the networking team and there's the people that pull cables. <laughs> so you get stashed with the individual that pull cables. Now, that's short-term work. Even a CISO that is working at the top of the chain of cybersecurity started off somewhere. And I guarantee you if most people would have a conversation with a CISO, a CISO would tell you where they started from. Some of them started from just PC repair. Some of them came from the uh, 80s and the 90s when, when there was uh, mainframe computers, large, very, very large mainframe computers. So what you have to remember is that leadership and development is very, very important because as part of the security engagement, you can make or break somebody's career. And if you are um, not practicing great leadership, then, you know, you can create some risk. So let's talk about risk for a second here. What are some of the risks that are involved with a workforce where, where those where those security engagement fail. Late work assignments. I'm going to bring this up because there's a communication link on every job. If you don't have a continuous engagement into cybersecurity itself, we're going to see late and very late working assignments. Skill set never grows, and all you are is a secretary. Increased labor because one of the things – I've always seen is that if a person do not know how to do a job, they will spend more time trying to do it, okay? <laughs> and that's where that increased labor comes to uh, surface. Destroy careers because I remember when I was in the uh, Navy, we used to state that the first two weeks was the most critical period of a new person that came on board a ship. If you did not provide leadership in those first two weeks and show them the right way, they would probably fail their entire career. So the same goes here. The most, um, the most important period is when someone is fresh out of college and you bring them on the job within like 90 days, 
really, really have to shape and show them the way through the ropes. Project delays happen. You do not want to delay any projects because if you don't have a continuous engagement into the cybersecurity, and if you're given a task, well, projects can be delayed. Vulnerabilities. When we look at vulnerabilities, they can exist in the workforce because people are not doing their job. So when I look at a vulnerability, it is a weakness. Okay, let's say, for instance, if, if someone, let's say if someone was not engaged into a vulnerability management program, right, and they was given a task to kind of go and to remediate a vulnerability, well, they will cause more vulnerabilities to occur. Okay, and see that vulnerability is that the patches are supposed to be deployed on the 15th of the month, but you can't make the 15th of the month. Now you just created a program vulnerability. So we can reduce that by being proactive and, uh, and also making sure that there's a continuous engagement into cybersecurity. I was not told there are some people that operate under that strategy. If you don't tell them what to do, they're not going to do it. All right. And those people usually become the unlikable person. So, in a continuous engagement uh, mode, a person has to stay motivated. Now, there are some jobs that have um, a small window to uh, ensure that people stay motivated, and then there are some jobs that will work along with people. But if you're involved with cybersecurity itself, and if you came out of college, and if you're trying to maneuver out the workforce and trying to be that great cybersecurity steward, you have to be motivated because you don't have to wait until somebody tell you what to do because if you know it has to get done, you go do it. And that's where that continuous engagement happens because as you engage cybersecurity more and more and more, that's when you become wise and understand how the architect operates. Lower, lower protect and increase risk. Mm. Okay, now that's the opposite of increased protection, okay, and lower risk. Now, here's what happens. Under this lower protect and increased risk, when, when there is no continual engagement, no active engagement, and individuals are not engaged in cybersecurity appropriately, you're going to create more risk. You create much work. You will find teams working harder and harder every day, but it's not our job to, to work harder, but to work smarter. All of this can be cleared, and it can be cleansed up. And that's why implementing a culture shift is the most important strategy. And in Chapter 1 of the Cybersecurity Mindset, I talk about some key topics that can help organizations have a stronger cybersecurity engagement off the top, you're going to have to have a buy-in structure, which, which means you need to get everybody on board to buy into cybersecurity. Some of the other um, things that work is you got to brand the organization where you build images for the organization. This is the way we want to operate. And you have your team to engage into that on a continual basis. Establish a win-win relationship. If you can engage cybersecurity appropriately, then we can reduce risk. We can give you a raise. You can get all the training you want. And then maybe the executive management, they can stay in the boardroom all day. Proactive security is very important too. Teach people to be proactive versus reactive. Now, I realize that certain times organization may just have to be reactive, but you want to be operating more so in the proactive stage versus the reactive stage. Everyone contributes. This is part of a culture shift. You want everyone to contribute because everyone has something to say. Everyone has a, a part of knowledge for cybersecurity. Everyone can contribute to the team to have a win-win type of relationship. Value proposition mentality in Chapter 16 of the Cybersecurity Mindset is very important because the value proposition mentality is saying, okay, 
if you gain these great skill sets, you can help this corporation become a high value asset. And when it and when the organization becomes a high value asset, that customers and clients want them to be around. Everyone benefits off of the value proposition mentality. And it will move multiple communication lanes and also to it support clients' engagement. And and you hear a, a great term by the team, we can reduce risk. And last but not least, as I stated before, when you have a cultural shift, that's when the organization become a high value asset. If you work in gov- government contracting, here is something that's very important because if you can install yourself as a high value asset, you will always get contracts. But to make that happen, you have to build your capabilities. In order to build your capability, you need to have a winning team, certification, train people that are constantly engaged into cybersecurity. See, that balance cybersecurity from the front line. Now, workforce development is a very critical issue now. Uh, if we think about the way the workforce is shaped and moving, you know, the workforce has to perform outside of the certifications and grow outside of certification because that's one of the main problems with cyber is that teens spend a lot of time working on certification and working on education. But then when it becomes an engagement for during the jobs, that's when the challenges happen. Okay. And there's no set stone or something written down that teaches people how to do their job. Individual has to stay engaged. Leadership has to um, be in place. And bureaucracy and unwritten rules have to be known. Now, the workforce for cybersecurity works across many lines. Looking at the financial industry, looking at the government industry, and also, too, just looking at the healthcare sector. You know, the healthcare sector has many challenges uh, from like robotic software to medical devices to data privacy, uh, HIPAA, and PII, because the medical industry is strong at trying to protect data. And this is where cybersecurity operates as well, too. But there are a lot of challenges for the healthcare sector. And if you are someone that works in the healthcare sector, I'm pretty sure you have seen many issues as it relates to cybersecurity. But stay with me because in episode six, we're going to talk about security challenges for the healthcare sector. And keep in mind, you are only as safe as your mindset. You've been listening to the Chief of Cybersecurity Podcast, where you have gained relevant knowledge to enhance your cybersecurity mindset. Be sure to visit DwayneHart.com to learn more about authored publications, show notes, and discover more information concerning cybersecurity.